But today we want to look at the challenges of bridging the food sovereignty gap between generations. Um, and I stop here because I'm not the one who is the expert on this, but I'm super happy, as I said, that we have uh, Christine and Irish um, and Jenna with us. And I hand back to Syed to take us through this one hour only. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hildegard, and welcome to all of you, wherever you are and whatever time it is in the world. <clears throat> I'm really excited about this talk because it's the culmination of the, this is the fourth, so this is our fourth talk, to uh, GFAR talk this year, this is the first time we've done these talks, and I think they've really attracted a wide audience because of the nature of the topics, but if you take this fourth one, it touches on all the ones that we've had already this year, it touches on governance and research and the basis on which we actually define what we mean by our food system. It deals with how we're going to deal with a post-conflict world in which we know that there are going to be further pandemics or further conflicts. How are we going to deal with those conflicts in terms of a food system that's sustainable and resilient and good for people and the planet? And it touches on resources. How do we put resources towards a different kind of food system? We've been very successful in subsidizing a traditional, if you like, a conventional food system in which calories and filling bellies has been the priority. We have to move beyond that. And that's why I couldn't be more excited both by the topic and our speakers. Uh, and, and, and Hildegard's done the introduction to the topic, so I won't go through that. But I want to introduce the two speakers and just take you through how we're going to uh, work today on this, on this presentation and, and talk. <clears throat> I'm going to invite Irish and then Christine to give a, a 12 to 15 minute presentation. They may have slides and if they do, I'd like them to share their screen so that their slides can actually be seen by everybody. And then we're gonna have a discussion. We're gonna have a moderated discussion in which I will simply feed questions in that you will be sending to me as the audience and as participants in this uh, really important uh, uh, discussion. At the end of that, I'm gonna ask, um, Jenna to actually make some comments because she is the co-host and she will have a very important constituency, youth and professionals involved in agriculture and research for development. And then final comments from the chair of GFA, Ravi. So that's gonna be our schedule. I'm gonna very quickly introduce our two speakers. I could give a very long introduction because they really have got such a, a wide pedigree and, 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 and comprehensive background. And that's why they're so important to our to our discussion today, but let me just take you through the two speakers and then ask them to speak to you directly. Um, Irish Magalay is the coordinator of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. Uh, as coordinator, she provides support to AFA, the uh, Asian Farmers Association, in different countries on different initi uh, initiatives in line with the women's farmers' agenda for sustainable agriculture and the implementation, as if you will remember, the United Nations Decade of Family Farming, which we are in. She's the, uh, on the steering committee of agro 4 which is the Agriculture for Food Security 2030, and she's in the coordination committee of the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism mm -hmm. of the Committee on World Food Security. She's got a degree in agriculture and community development, and she previously worked with development organizations where she led the implementation of projects and action research programs on food security, nutrition, and family farming in partnerships with stakeholders and with government agencies. So Irish is going to speak first with that very broad background that she has very relevant to the issues that we're going to be uh, hearing about and discussing today. Now let me introduce Christine, who will speak immediately afterwards. So we'll, we'll, we'll go straight from the first speaker to the second. Uh, and uh, as, as Hildegard has mentioned, Thought for Food is a unique and remarkable organization. And Christine is not just the CEO, she's the founder. This is her baby. This is the, the, the idea that she actually generated into a, into a community now, 30,000 millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs in 180 countries who are dedicated to transforming food systems for good. And that sounds familiar. The programs she's developed have generated 8,000 breakthrough business ideas, 8,000, and helped to launch 70 startups who've raised hundreds of millions of dollars, formed partnerships with industry leaders, improved the lives of half a million smallholder farmers, and created over 500 jobs. Wow. 
Christine's led external affairs, public policy, and uh, corporate affairs functions for leading multinationals, fast growing startups, think tanks, and industry associations. Um, she's the author of The Changemaker's Guide to Feeding the Planet. Uh, she's the producer of two documentary films on next gen agri food tech solutions. And she spearheaded global events in Berlin, Lisbon, Zurich, Amsterdam, Rio de Janeiro, and most appropriately, Rome. So those are our two speakers, and that's why I'm so excited to introduce them both to you. Let me take no more time in uh, introducing them, but ask them now to speak to you directly. And let me first ask Irish if she can speak and if she can share her screen so that her slides are available uh, and visible to all of us. Irish. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Syed. And um, I hope you can uh, hear me clearly. So my apologies as I am currently in a um, in an open space uh, because uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, our 20 years in AFA and uh, we also have this uh, event in the Philippines. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I also want to add that um, I am an indigenous person from the northern uh, mountainous province of uh, the Philippines. So I am from the Ifugao ethnic tribe, and also I am a doctor of a farmer. So it is really an honor for me to represent um, here today in this DFAR Talks, the uh, Alliance of National Farmers Organization in Asia. So um, we are so thankful that uh, Jifar invited us to take part in this uh, debate uh, for inviting me and, and AFA. And as mentioned by um, Syed, we are a regional organization. It is composed of 20 national farmers uh, federation in 16 countries with a total membership of around 13 million small scale women, men, young farmers, producers engaging in crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. So um, as, as mentioned, so our organization is, you know, it's, it's 13, uh, 13 million. And, and, I, and of course, uh, Asia Pacific is, is, is more than that. But um, however, we, we believe that our organization, along with our uh, other uh, smallholder farmers are uh, significant in uh, in uh, feeding uh, the region, Asia uh, Pacific. And we also know that um, Asia Pacific uh, still relies on small scale farmers, forest producers, fishers, herders for diverse uh, diet. And um, beyond uh, food production, uh, we uh, smallholder or small scale farmers, fishers are also contributing to sustaining our communities. And uh, not just that, but we are also conserving agrobiodiversity. And um, we, we, we can talk more about that uh, because uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the topic that um, we are uh, talking about in this, um, in this uh, discussion. And also, um, as small scale uh, producers and indigenous peoples, we have developed innovations that have enabled us to sustain our livelihoods for, for years. And our farming communities have uh, thrived uh, with agriculture intertwined with our culture. As I mentioned, I am uh, from uh, an indigenous community where we have uh, we live in 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 um, mountainous regions, and we have to carve the mountains so that we can survive. And we have we were able to grow rice for thousands of years, um, but we have to also protect our forest. We have to develop a, a culture so that we can we can protect um, our natural uh, resources. However, um, despite the fact that we small scale producers, fishers are producing food, uh, feeding our communities. Um, we also know the fact that uh, the hungry and the poor and those that are much affected by climate change and those who are neglected and left behind are among our constituencies. I'm here representing about 20 national farmers organization. And earlier today, um, we, we even talk about uh, you know the, 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 the degraded lands where where we live uh, yesterday we have visited a community an indigenous community uh, which is two hours from metro manila whose lives and livelihoods are threatened uh, by the construction of, uh, of a mega dam 
However, uh, with all the challenges that we are facing now, the multiple crises, uh, I will not uh, mention, but uh, yeah, I, I won't uh, mention uh, other uh, other issues. But uh, with 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 the context that we have now, we have uh, organized ourselves and formed our organization so that we can collectively call on our governments and you as our partners to to support us in our uh, struggle and recognize our contribution. So now I want to go back. I want to uh, to to dwell on, on the topic. So with this collective action on forgotten food, this is very important uh, to us, the small holder uh, or small scale farmers. Maybe we can move to the to the next slide. Yeah, it's uh, and next slide. Sorry. It's, it's very uh, timely uh, because we are facing multiple crises and um, we just, although we just formed this collective action on to, in 2020, but we believe that this collective action on forgotten food can be our platform and an or opportunity for us uh, to call on our governments to, to call on you as our partners to recognize our multidimensional roles and our contribution to addressing the challenges that uh, we are facing now. The next slide. Um, yeah, uh, we want to thank GIFAR and other partners, the regional um, Research Association, um, APAARI, for allowing us to have a perception survey, which is part of the collective action. Uh, we did this perception survey in 2021, and the perception survey uh, has informed the, the regional uh, manifesto on forgotten food, which fits into the global manifesto on forgotten food. So with this gesture, with this action that we did, uh, you, you have shown that what we, what we have to say, the perception of women, young farmers about forgotten food, about their challenges, um, it shows that uh, you wanted to, 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 you wanted to hear our voice, what we have to say, and ensure that our voice are actually placed in the regional manifesto. So we are grateful for providing the opportunity, providing this stage, this platform uh, for us. And um, the next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, I just want to show with this slide that uh, this is the, the process that we have um, undertaken in, in order for us to uh, develop the Global Manifesto on Forgotten Food. So the Global Manifesto on Forgotten Food is very important to us because we can, you know, we can uh, hold our partners accountable. We can hold our governments uh, also um, uh, accountable. We can use it as a tool for them to support uh, what we do. So the process is now, um, on the ground, so we are starting a, um, a national collective action in India. So we started with a survey, we have the regional manifesto, global manifesto, and now we are um, implementing uh, the global manifesto in, in India as a start. And hopefully uh, we can do this in more, uh, more countries. And as you can see on the slide, with the collective action at the national level, we will start with local level consultation. Uh, uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just want to emphasize in these slides that uh, this collective action will work with farmers organization, uh, us at the regional level, and then uh, we also have a national farmers organization, and then at the state level, we will also have national farmers, I mean, uh, sub-regional uh, farmers uh, organization. So it is through the organizations and cooperatives where where uh, the local level consultation will happen. Uh, and also for, for AFA, it is through our um, organization that uh, we empower women and young farmers because we have mechanisms within our organization where we train, where we uh, capacitate uh, both women, men, and young farmers organization. So on the next slide, um, what I want to show there is that 
um, in the design of the local level consultation and dialogue that we will be having to, to realize the global manifesto. It will involve uh, not just the men, not just the women, but also um, young farmers. And uh, as emphasized earlier, the, the survey that we have conducted, we have responses from young farmers um, in uh, various countries, uh, I think 17 countries, and uh, this is really a good start. So it will, uh, it, the, the whole collective action will be guided by the perception of men, women, and young uh, farmers. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so we are hoping that um, through the, the manifesto and through the collective action on forgotten food, we can show that we are reliable partners of governments in dealing and in addressing poverty, addressing uh, hunger, and also uh, delivering on, on, uh, on, on the uh, 2030 agenda. So we, we, we truly uh, treasure this uh, platform that uh, GIFAR has initiated, the partnership that GIFAR has initiated with other regional um, agencies, because not only that we can empower our women farmers who are um, custodians of agrobiodiversity or forgotten food, but it will also allow us to, to, to strengthen our whole, our organization uh, from sub-regional or sub-national national to regional organization. And as I have said, it is through our organization that we empower the young farmers because we have set up mechanisms such as the young farmers uh, committees. Uh, and also we have women farmers committees. And we are also um, uh, building forums of, of young farmers. And it's uh, with the forgotten food, um, this uh, collective action can be mainstream in these uh, mechanisms. So uh, I think um, these are my uh, last slides. Um, can you uh, move on to, to the next, please? Okay, so um, I want to show this photo and I want to end this, uh, I mean, this, um, this, uh, um, presentation with, with these photos that we have collected from across uh, Asia Pacific. And um, this is a call for you, our partners, and we also use this to call onto our gov governments. So um, with, with the global manifesto that we have agreed, uh, uh, we, we, we are watching our partners really implement what is in, in the global manifesto, which is about transforming partnership, transforming how research is done, and uh, really recognizing women, men, and young farmers as uh, actors in uh, addressing uh, the sustainability challenges, actors in the value chain, actors in, in the food system. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for this opportunity um, to, to say uh, these uh, words. Wonderful. Iris, thank you. That's a wonderful, comprehensive and, and very succinct uh, expression uh, of, of what the forgotten food is. The point about transforming not just food systems, but the way we do research and the way we empower communities. So I think that's really set the scene. Christine, can we ask you to now give your your introductory presentation, and then we'll come to the discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you see me and hear me and see my slides? Excellent. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's amazing to be here, reconnected with many of you whom I've had the chance and pleasure to work with, and of course, uh, to be with Professor Syed, who's a great inspiration to me in my career and in my work. Um, and yeah, to be talking about a subject that I'm deeply passionate about, um, which are forgotten foods or through the lens of uh, how we talk about it at Thought for Food with our global network of entrepreneurially minded young people, future crops, um, because we really believe that these forgotten foods are going to be the opportunities to fix our food system for the future. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm working with a network of uh, millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs in every region of the world. And over the past decade, I've had the chance to really kind of study their values, attitudes, and approaches and have seen that they are demanding new things out of the world, out of our economies, and out of our food system. 
they are looking at our food system and saying we can do better. We need to build a food system that is fit for our generations. Um, you know, we have designed our food system to work in the way it has done. And that's been designed by previous generations who, as Professor Syed mentioned, designed for calories and not necessarily nutrition. So how do we redesign the future of our food system so that it is nutritious as well as sustainable, as well as diverse and locally relevant and culturally relevant and empowering of, you know, groups that have been marginalized to date. Um, so that demand is increasing. There's also a global opportunity here with these forgotten foods or future crops. This isn't just about, you know, necessarily the foods that we eat. It's also about, you know, bringing forward new proteins, new types of flavors and aromas, uh, functional foods, and customizing all of this to local tastes and preferences. So with this global opportunity and increasing demand, there is also a huge opportunity to develop solutions. Right now, um, there is a lack of technification. And I do wanna just emphasize that I'm not advocating that we should start putting strong intellectual property regimes and market forces onto these crops. But if you look at it through the lens of like, okay, how can we increase the productivity and the sustainability and the empowerment of farmers using some technological and digitized solutions? You know, you can start to galvanize, again, these entrepreneurially minded people to become interested and solving these problems. And we have the chance to build solutions that take us to new frontiers, solutions that are regenerative by design, that are circular, and that are including and sharing the benefits of you know, the, um, the business models that are developed back with the originators and holders of the knowledge. So with this lens, we think that there is a lot of opportunity around uh, future crops. And we've built Thought for Food as an innovation engine that is actually galvanizing people who care about building better food systems to focus specifically in these areas. And what we do is we engage them, we excite them about the innovation policy uh, possibilities, we show them where these you know, blank spaces are that we need solutions around. We help to accelerate ideas that are very promising and can be turned into viable uh, ventures. And we help to connect those ventures into investment opportunities, be that from the traditional world of investment like venture capital, collaboration opportunities with the industry, or even new models. Um, again, because the world is changing so quickly, there's all kinds of exciting ways for businesses to be supported in today's world. And so, yeah, that's kind of like a, a snapshot of what we do at Thought for Food. And actually, we've really honed in on this topic. Um, in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, we partnered with the Good Food Institute and APAC to run a specific targeted innovation challenge around unleashing next-gen crop opportunities. And I'll speak a little bit about what those crop opportunities are. Um, but I wanted to also give a snapshot of some of the trends we're seeing around these future crops. So, you know, as mentioned, our next generations around the world are tending to seek diverse, nutritious and sustainable foods. And right now they're not getting that from the three crops that are representing the majority of our diets. Um, and I think there's like 50 crops that represent 90% of our diets, but there's 7,000 or more crops that we can actually be tapping into. And they offer not only enormous potential to nourish us, but also to make our planet more climate resilient and appeal to these novel food experiences that particularly young people are seeking. They wanna taste things that are new and different and better. So how do we unleash these next-gen crop opportunities that allow us to bring forward local traditional flavors and aromas? Well, a couple of examples that have emerged through Thought for Food are rain-fed foods uh, led by Sujala in Canada, and she's of Indian descent. And she's actually going to be speaking at the World Food Forum later today about a crop she's very passionate about, which is millet. And I think, you know, um, I don't need to talk about the power of millet to this audience, because I think many of you know, but she's mainstreaming millet in collaboration with smallholder farmers, particularly women farmers from India, and bringing forward a new type of plant-based milk for the the market that is, you know, vertically integrated across the supply chain and showing how millet, which, you know, is very rich in nutrients, is, um, you know, drought tolerant and has all kinds of like beneficial properties can be something that we incorporate beyond just the oat milk and, you know, almond milk that we're seeing that has some uh, negative externalities when it comes to sustainability. WTH Foods, 
means worth, worth the health. And they're a Filipino company that's making plant-based alternatives to traditional Filipino cuisine. So uh, oftentimes when we think about plant-based uh, foods, we think about burgers and chicken nuggets because those have been the ones that have been launched by some of the big companies. But there's a whole slew of startups all over the world that are saying we can bring forward locally relevant um, you know, crops that have been traditionally grown in our regions and in our countries. And we can also make plant-based food much more exciting than burgers and chicken nuggets and Western types foods and localize them into the foods that we're used to eating that are, um, you know, uh, normally made with meats. Another um, important aspect of this transition is to make sure that we're building new types of business models that are circular and inclusive. So we're seeing that next gens are thinking beyond sustainability towards regeneration, regenerating economies, regenerating communities, you know, regenerating um, the environment. And when you talk about regeneration, it's not about doing less harm, but it's about actively doing good and designing solutions that are including marginalized people like women and smallholders and youth and really like designing these solutions that have a net positive impact. A couple of examples um, are Microterra in Mexico, who are actually developing a plant-based uh, protein alternative from spirulina, but they're actually involving um, smallholder pond fisheries into their um, business model. They're actually utilizing the underutilized, underutilized sections of ponds to grow the spirulina, thereby giving these smallholder farmers an extra revenue stream and reducing water pollution from these ponds. So it's a really holistic win-win-win solution because it's serving uh, the plant-based protein mar market with a new crop, it's empowering smallholders with a new revenue stream, and it's reducing pollution all in one. AgriCycle Global is a US-based company that has really designed for um, circularity. They work directly with communities, um, taking uh, locally relevant crops and developing value-added products, which then uh, they reinvest their profits back into these communities around training and education and really um, helping the communities and the people that they work with to continue to grow and benefit from their business model. And another interesting trend um, that I see is that next gens are looking towards ancient wisdom and traditional knowledge and actually bringing in digitization and technology as a way to honor those traditions and knowledge. Uh, you do see in Gen Z's in particular, a resurgence of interest in topics like mental health and how nutrition can play a role too in physical health and you know biohacking and all of these optimizing um, how we live and can find happiness through food. Um, and really interestingly, they're saying, how can we bring the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, digital applications to help to spread this knowledge, which is held in so many communities um, and bring that more forward into the industry, into consumer products, again, while also building business models so that traditional peoples are sharing in the benefits and values of these. And a couple of examples, we have the Live Green Co. Um, that is actually a company that was launched in Chile um, by a woman from India. And they are, uh, they've built an um, AI powered engine that can replace synthetic and animal based additives in the foods that we love, like ice creams and, um, you know, different types of hamburgers and things like this with plant based alternatives. And she's really uh, honing in on her. Um, expertise in Ayurvedic and traditional medicine to identify these. Humica in Mexico is a team that I absolutely love. They're actually also, I think they spoke at WFF yesterday, um, but they are um, bringing forward the power of biochar into how we are able to nourish and fertilize the crops themselves. And they work specifically with smallholder women farmers across Africa, uh, across uh, Central America and particularly Mexico and help them to um, implement biochar that's uh, designed specifically for their soil needs. And they're also linking the women who use their biochar um, to market opportunities and they help with their marketing and positioning as you know, climate solutions that are you know, good for your health. Um, and so thereby creating uptake both at the farmer level and the consumer level for more sustainable products. 
So what I think is really interesting, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm out of time, I see something coming in the chat, so I'm not sure uh, if it's telling me I need to go, but um, okay, so uh, we need to change the what and how of how we innovate. We need to be looking at how we can build systemic and holistic solutions from the ground up at TFF. We really believe strongly in continuous bottom-up innovation, and that is why we work through a network of entrepreneurs in so many countries across all of the regions of the world. We want to use the latest and greatest cutting-edge tech to actually build models that aren't, aren't just optimized and made for maximum efficiency, but are actually built for regeneration and inclusivity. And how do we create these type of new collaborative and inclusive business models that are empowering people, especially farmers and holders of traditional knowledge, and so that they can share in the benefits and um, you know, have not just these winner takes all value capture IP mechanisms. And that's also a topic that's very uh, dear to me is building new types of you know, benefit sharing models. I've spent a large part of my career on the ABS topic, access and benefit sharing, but I think we need to bring more of that into how we're developing food system innovation going forward really quickly because I'm sure I'm out of time, but you know, do look, uh, if you are an entrepreneur watching this, think about these opportunities, these next-gen opportunities. There's so much opportunity out there, possibility that needs innovation. There are so many exciting crops out there that we can bring into the mainstream. And when you are an entrepreneur, you look at some of the challenges that these crops face and actually view them as an opportunity to say, that's a problem I can solve. So if you're saying like mung bean carries some allergen risk, maybe there's breeding programs to breed out that allergenicity. But there's new types of questions that need to be asked and complexity that needs to be explored. And we need the next generation to step in and be looking at these crops as exciting frontiers for their innovative mindsets. Um, we're here to remake the food system together with the next generations and forgotten crops, or as we like to call them, future crops are the place we need to be focusing. Um, thank you for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Syed, I think you're muted. But the question's coming in on the chat group and also on my WhatsApp, which is buzzing, <laughs> is how can we work with these people? <laughs> so everything you were seeing going on in the background is people saying, how can we work with you? How can we actually link, not just with you, but with Irish? And just, it's clear to me that the synergies that we've just seen are just getting people excited about, you know, opportunity, opportunity, the ones that you've actually mentioned and so many others that we already have. What I want to come to as a first question, and this is one that we've really got to address collectively, is here we are discussing opportunities, the way that we actually can think of different ways of doing the food system, but we haven't discussed and come to the questions that you've raised also about how do we get empowerment of technologies? How do we get sovereignty over people's ideas so that communities have access to technology how do they then own that technology so that it doesn't become something, you know, an, an IP of, an, of a multi you know, building corporation? And how do, and, and this was the, the, the point that somebody's already just uh, said to me is, um, you know, is this going to lead to a new form of neo colonialism? These are really big issues. And if we don't address them, we're going to uh, simply be giving license, if you like, to someone else to take away the indigenous knowledge as well as the indigenous crops that people have actually protected for so long. So, um, Irish, can I ask you to take that question, really big question on board first, and then Christine to respond. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Christine, also for uh, the great presentation, and thank you, Sayed. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give, um, I want to respond to that uh, question uh, first by giving a, an example of uh, of what happened in, in Sri Lanka uh, before, of course, the, the, the challenge that they are facing now. But yes, there was a regulation um, from the government, uh, a seed policy, wherein it will, it, it's, it's possible to criminalize you know, smallholder farmers uh, to produce seeds that are not registered, especially the indigenous seeds, which the small scale farmers, the tribal groups are, are producing. Um, because of that, uh, of that, uh, like a plan, the small scale farmers organization through the Farmers Forum Network in Sri Lanka and with support of other um, development partners, they have uh, advocated, they have really 
raise their voice and have advocated with their with with their governments uh, what this can uh, uh, do to them uh, that this is harmful to the to the lives and livelihoods of uh, small scale farmers and they were able to win uh, that uh, you know that that plan so i want to use that as a, an example moving forward so so what can we do so I think for AFA, it's our collective action. It's uh, it's through our organization that we will continue to engage with our governments, engage with regional bodies, uh, engage with private uh, sector um, on so that our livelihoods will be uh, you know protected. Our natural resources will be. Uh, protected so yeah we will we will continue to strengthen our uh, organization to do um, advocacy work and it, yeah it's important for us to to to, to raise uh, to raise our voice and that's why you are we, all of you are here you are our partners uh, uh, we cannot do this um, alone we really need uh, 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 partners um, who could you know who could uh, understand the situation of uh, small scale farmers uh, who who you know who, who are willing to, to empower small scale farmers to raise their their voice thank you christine let's pick this up but uh, i think irish you're really saying it needs partnerships it needs collaboration but it needs equal partnerships not a technology transfer program that somebody else is suddenly going to say here's the answer to your problem so we we really have to build them that's what the collective action really is distilling a different way of doing things Chris, yeah. how do we address the particular challenge of technology yeah that comes available to people who who hear about digitization they hear about all these breakthroughs and and, and, and new yeah. ways of looking at you know systems that we previously have thought of as traditional now we can bring new technology to to, to their benefit but how do we do that yeah, I think that what um, Irish just stated is exactly right. Like we know what we need to do and we need to continue to advocate for that in policy realms and, you know, you know, in all of the discussions we're having about food systems transformation. But what we're doing at Thought for Food is not just, you know, talking about what needs to happen, but equipping innovators to think about how to do this. So we have created um, a series of kind of learning programs, training modules, and and peer-to-peer -peer ecosystems for people to share experiences where we can, one, study previous approaches that have not worked, where there has been, you know, kind of this um, exploitation, right, or uh, like the... Um, yeah, I, I, the neo-colonialist type approaches. We can study those and say, how can we do better? And then what we can do is help innovators build, you know, and study new types of business models, right? And so one of the things that we have built into our acceleration program is open and collaborative business model training. And so how do we work hand in hand with smallholder farmers, traditional peoples, so that as to use your words, they have an equal seat at the table and this doesn't become like, we have the solution that you have to take up, but actually like build that hand in hand with them. We have one particular model called um, WTF, which stands not for what you think it stands for, but it stands for where's the farmer. And that is really also equipping people with the, the language and the mindset of how to work hand in hand with farmers. We also provide a lot of case studies. One that jumps to mind is Sarawak Biodiversity Center, which was set up in the Borneo rainforest by the Malaysian you know, government as part of this access and benefit sharing protocol that has come into place. But it is really looking at new types of business models that allow um, entities to commercialize the uh, valuable biodiversity that comes from the Borneo rainforest, but and ensures that the people's of Borneo are benefiting, right, in anything uh, that is commercialized from the rainforest, from their biodiversity and traditional knowledge. So that is an interesting model that is a public-private partnership, if you will, that involves knowledge exchange, that involves um, creation of uh, case studies and examples that others can learn from. And I've been working with Sarawak Biodiversity Center to take some of the learnings that they've gleaned and connect that with our innovator community in Brazil, for example. And so we're always trying to share real life examples of things that haven't worked and things that have worked so that we can have this continuous evolution and do better in how we're um, developing these types of solutions. And we can't just look at technology to fix this. We have to look at innovation, 
holistically as business models, as well as consumer behaviors, and of course, as well as technology. And that's where a new type of, if we're going to do food systems transformation, we also need to change the investment paradigm because too often when we are looking at startups, like the ones I mentioned, they're only getting invested in when they have strong and heavy IP and technified approaches. And, you know, how do we bring the spirit of investment into the types of innovation that I mentioned that go beyond technical innovation and winner takes all models? Thank you. Um, you're both different kinds of leaders to the ones that we're used to. And I think for that purpose, I, I want to ask a personal question really. Um, how do you see this as, as both of you are role models for women? And I want you to, to address this specifically for women and how this, this question of forgotten crops, forgotten foods, different ways of doing research actually puts, we always say farmers at the center of innovation, but women farmers. And at the same point in our title and the discussion we're having, transfer of generational knowledge. So the idea that ideas that have been there in people's heads, vernacular and people's ownership of ideas have to transfer across generations through women and young people. Let's just address that specifically, women first, and then how you see this actually bringing young people in to a different kind of research and a different kind of agriculture and food system. Christine, please, please have a go first. Yeah, okay, so specifically on the aspect of, you know, young people, I think that, you know, one of the things I've learned is that in many parts of the world, agriculture is seen as a sector that it is not filled with opportunity and is actually one that has poor prospects. And many young people are actively disincentivized by their parents to not go into agriculture. Um, and so what we also try to do with Thought for Food, but besides just training the next generation of entrepreneurially minded innovators is to excite them about this sector. And you mentioned in the intro, like that we've done a couple of documentary films and you know, that is part of the way that we're exciting people. We're showing them that there is opportunity to bring forward their values and attitudes and approaches and to apply those to like the world's biggest challenges and to do things in new ways and that they can be the ones kind of leading and pioneering some of the solutions that we need. Um, again, while honoring, you know, traditions and um, all of the valuable, you know, centuries of knowledge that we have. And so it's this kind of, you know, bridging the generations that you talked about, which is really, really important. But one of the steps that we actively take is, is really exciting people about the future, right? And not making this something that seems, uh, again, like, you know, an, a sector that is uh, old fashioned or dying out or that there is no economic prospects. Um, and so I think through that and showing people that there are entrepreneurial solutions that has, you know, helped to uh, bridge the generations. And in addition, we see that a lot of the approaches that young people are bringing forward, um, they're almost like reverse mentoring their parents and, you know, smallholder farmers and, and helping. And that's that dialogue. Um, I jokingly say sometimes that Thought for Food were like the dongle, uh, which is a technological device that you can plug into, for example, a Mac computer to make it work with existing systems that were developed for, you know, other older um, versions of um, computers. And you need that dongle to make them work together. And like, that's what we're doing at Thought for Food. We're the dongle of food and agriculture. We're making the old system and the new system work together. And it's not perfect, but it's, you know, it's doing things that haven't been before possible. Um, and then around like how to, you know, uh, empower women, there's so many lessons and experiences that I've seen throughout my career, both at Thought for Food and working in the various entities that I've worked in, in agriculture. And there's a lot of um, opportunity there, but there's a lot of need to, to, you know, like understand cultures and contexts when you are working with women. And because uh, in households, women are often the decision makers about nutritious food and even about um, the crops that will be grown, but maybe they're not the vocal ones talking about which inputs to buy or procuring the seeds or the other types of agricultural inputs. So, you know, at one company I worked with, they actually launched a whole program where they reframed the um, agricultural sales team to be women. So there was a more uh, aligned way to talk to women farmers, right, than having the, the way that it had always been done with their, you know, 
male uh, sales team. So I think these types of like solutions are needed if we really want to like be able to engage diverse voices in new ways. We have to like adjust our approaches um, and be creative and innovative in the way that we do that so that we can elevate perspectives and complexities that might otherwise be hidden because we're trying to you know, do things in ways that aren't effective or that, you know, aren't um, rep, uh, respecting the, the cultural complexities and variabilities around the world. Wonderful. And I want um, Irish, who's really at the front end of this in terms of the number and the number of countries and, you know, the issues that, that, that she actually faces in, 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 in the Asian Farmers Association. Irish, how do women and young people become the leaders and how do they actually become the centers of innovation rather than as we tended to think of as recipients of technologies that we, we actually transfer to them? What is your experience and what would be the advice that you would give that these are the experiences that we can actually take that we can develop in, in other parts of the world as women can take leadership roles? Yeah, thank you, um, Sayed. So, um... Uh, first of all, I want to, I think uh, I have uh, somehow uh, emphasized this uh, in the earlier uh, uh, session or presentation, but I just want to emphasize that for this uh, to happen, it's really important for uh, uh, partners for development partners for uh, officials to first recognize women as farmers so uh, even you know even in in these times in in some countries you know women are not uh, recognized as farmers because of uh, you know of some technicalities they don't own the land titles uh, for example in you know in, in South Asia and uh, governments would you know would recognize farmers who have land titles and farmers who have been registered in their registry or database. And sometimes, you know, those processes um, disallow, you know, women farmers to be, you know, uh, not to be considered as, as farmers. And so they don't receive uh, support. They don't receive even uh, training. So I think that's, uh, we need to uh, first uh, like recognize them and we need to advocate that, you know, um, now we have more than 50% um, uh, women farmers in the total number of, of farmers and this number is, is really huge and if they are recognized and given proper recognition then that would be a good starting point and we also know that women farmers are the custodians of, um, of many of the uh, neglected underutilized species some of them even uh, in Lao for example while they don't really grow uh, indigenous uh, crops or um, they don't um, yeah they don't uh, grow the the forgotten crops um, but they collect them you know in 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 their fields in in, in the forest um, so it's it's really the women who has the the knowledge when it comes to to all uh, to to these and yeah, that's that's the first thing that uh, that I want to to emphasize: recognition of uh, of women uh, farmers. And um, in in AFA, um, we emphasize uh, on on mix having a mixed farmers organization and creating spaces so that women farmers will flourish along with the men farmers. So in, in governance of farmers organization, we always ensure that women are well represented. And in, in, in at the regional level, we have created a mechanism, a, a women farmers mechanism where, you know, where uh, where women farmers from different countries organizations are represented so so that's one it's important for us to create mechanisms spaces forums for women farmers to 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 raise their voice to to see the situation of their fellow uh, farmers and that's how we can you know we can create solidarity uh, among women uh, farmers and it's also through the these platforms mechanisms that they get inspired and you know would want to become leaders uh, um, as well and uh, and it's it's the same for for young farmers while we recognize that um, the young farmers are, are losing interest in uh, in uh, forgotten crops or neglected underutilized crops because of, of uh, their the, the price of these crops are not really um, if we say economically viable um, however um, in, in AFA, we have also set up like mechanism, like funding mechanism, so that the young farmers are given resources to experiment 
um, and you know to to develop uh, technologies to 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 intervene within the whole value chain from production to processing uh, when it comes to um, traditional uh, crops. So these are the key things that we have tested. We provided resources for young farmers within our organization. Um, and also we created uh, platforms, forums uh, for building the capacities of our uh, young farmers. And it uh, also, I want to say that even the young farmers or uh, some of them are not recognized as, as farmers because um, you know they don't have the, the same thing that the land titles um, and in many cultures land titles are passed on either to the firstborn uh, or you know um, it depends on, on, on the culture or uh, the norms. So yeah, um, those are the things that I want to, to emphasize. So creating mechanisms, um, creating spaces and uh, recognizing them um, and providing them uh, the support uh, that, that they need. Thank you, Irish. And I think, um, I mean, I wish we had another round for this conversation, but I want to bring together, I mean, we can talk about advocacy and conservation and vision and plans, but I want both of you in one minute to say, because uh, two quick points. One is lots of people are saying, how can we actually connect with you? Well, GFAR will make sure that we make the connections. I'm not gonna list them all just now, but at least 20 people have been saying, you know, how do we actually talk to these people and work with them? So that will be something, and this is recorded, so you'll have a much bigger audience when we actually play this to, uh, to, to, to a public, uh, global public. I want one point you want to make to this group, this global audience, in terms of what they should do, what should we do next, that you have one action that you wish to actually uh, propose for us to actually take away from this meeting. And Irish, please, and then, and then Christine with your, with your one action that we should follow. Irish first. Uh, yes, so uh, first is I want to mention that um, there are existing coalitions that really support uh, smallholder farmers. So uh, one coalition is the um, Agroecology Coalition. And I think this is one of the spaces where, um, where you can join and also engage with us um, because we believe that it's also through agroecology that you know farmers are recognized for uh, being actors in uh, transforming uh, the food systems. So um, yeah, you can check out uh, agroecology uh, coalition, um, and I think yeah there are uh, upcoming activities where you can engage uh, with the wider uh, uh, network, and um, yeah, and and also at the national level. Uh, we, we can connect, you know, we can connect you with our uh, members and also partners. Uh, we work uh, not just with our members, but we work with other farmers organization in Asia Pacific. So you can engage uh, with them. Uh, and they all, these are an apex farmers organization, and they have sub national local uh, uh, members so you can you know you can uh, engage with them through their local uh, organization subnational uh, organization and you can also engage through the national coalition of family of farming in some countries like the Philippines um, in, in in India in Nepal in in Indonesia so these national committee of family farming are existing and this uh, this is one of the mechanisms that uh, uh, led by farmers organization. Thank you. Christine, last word. So yeah, a mantra that guides me in my life is if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. And I think we certainly don't have time for that given the challenges, the urgent existential challenges that we face. So I implore everyone to open your mind, to be experimental and to do things that make you uncomfortable. And that means like, you know, with, when it comes to youth and entrepreneurs and innovators, don't discount their wild and crazy ideas. Don't say that's not how we do it at the UN. Oh, you know, I have decades of experience and knowledge and expertise, and I know better than you actually open your mind. Um, in the same way, I tell that, by the way, to our next gen entrepreneurs who get feel daunted when it comes to working with the UN or with experts to say, 
try, do it, you know, bring your passion um, and also learn about these systems, right? That you haven't been exposed to. If all of us do that and embrace an exploratory and entrepreneurial and experimental mindset, I think we can start to forge brave new solutions um, that are required now. And so that's kind of my action and message. Uh, go wild and, and open your mind to some of the stuff that, you know, is needed and, and not just the ideas, but how to work with people. Thank you. Thank you both. I can't thank you enough for both, both of your presentations. And it's a scary world out there and there's a lot of challenges and everybody's sitting there and saying, you know, what are we going to do about the situation we're in? Both of you have illustrated practical vision that we can actually now think about and actions that I'm very grateful that you've actually given us. I'm going to give the floor to Jenna to, to make some concluding remarks and ask Ravi just a, a, a very quick vote of thanks, I think, in final comments to, to end this excellent session. So thank you all very much and thank you for all of those who've attended and participated in this really important discussion. Thank you all. Jenna. Thank you so much, Saeed, for the floor. And thank you so much to Irish and Christine for the wonderful discussion. In summary, Forgotten Foods present an opportunity for our generation, for the next generation, and something that we aren't getting through our current diets. Christine provided us very concrete examples of young people creating opportunities to use forgotten foods, or as she aptly phrased it, future foods. We heard from Irish that bringing in indigenous knowledge is essential in the fight for forgotten foods, as indeed these crops have been cultivated and preserved by indigenous communities. So also their food sovereignty rights are key in this discussion, and we have to make sure that we keep this central to the discussion. Bringing stakeholders together with a special focus on typically marginalized stakeholders, like we touched on women and youth, is also essential. Through the discussion portion especially, we emphasize that ownership and food sovereignty is essential for forgotten foods, preventing it from becoming a new frontier of neocolonialism. Irish told us also about policies which protect indigenous crops and really put some teeth behind this food sovereignty fight. And so my call to action would be for us also in our work to support policies and those advocating for those policies. We need to make sure that that's at the center of our work and our messaging and also our advocacy at GFAR and YPAR and beyond. Finally, we had a very rich discussion also about generational renewal, because indeed this is the World Food Forum. And we are also talking about this generation, the future generation. And driving generational renewal in agriculture is indeed complex. Thought for Food is providing young people with information on exciting developments in agriculture, so fighting that um, complex stereotype of agriculture, but also startup funds, right? So providing some of that finance to overcome the finance barrier. And Irish talked about how political representation of indigenous peoples, women, and youth can also empower us to shape food systems, which is also very key to protect our right to food, food sovereignty, and to shape the food systems that we want to see. Finally, in addition, organizations like universities, but also YPARD and GFAR are providing capacity building support and allyship mentorship to contribute to an enabling environment. And we see that the co-design co and co-creation and co-implementation of programs is key. So my takeaway message is also never for us without us. Ravi, over to you for the final word. Thank you, Sayyid. Well, we had a very excellent session. And I'm not going to repeat what has been said by Irish and Crispin and very ably summed up by Gina. The point I captured, uh, which I may like to say as a key message is, GFAR is on the right path. We we have taken collective actions as the key mandate of GFAR. And I think we are learning as we are moving ahead. And we, we are keeping farmers at the center of innovation. However, the challenges will be many, as we heard, when we go for entrepreneurship. Uh, what Christine mentioned was like the what and the how of innovation, which has to be changed, which is termed by many in US as frugal innovation. The frugal innovation concept is where I think she was highlighting. And she said that demand for future crop is high, but 
the solutions are lagging, but she gave a solution like open your mind. I think she, she gave the problem and she gave the solution quite well. And this open your mind, which was mentioned, I think something which is the key here as a crux of the whole last one hour what we have spent. And for Irish, I must say, it's a wonderful job being done with indigenous people, with farmers. It's an excellent collective action with the local consultations going up the top. The plan I know is with national workshops and international workshops, buying from the government. So the first step is like, recognizing the importance of the farmers for driving the research agenda of every food system, which the collective action will bring awareness. It's not only forgotten food, it is the innovative process of working of GFAR, I think, which is very crucial, where we can really get the ownership and get the policies in place. Once we have made the voice and the noise of the farmers and Unfortunately, most of the top politicians in the world, they say we, we are from farming community, we are farmers, and when they become the prime ministers and presidents, let me not name that, they just forget agriculture. This is a grim scenario, and they think of it when there is conflict, war, or food insecurity issues. So I, I would like to stop here. I may not like to repeat what has been said excellently by Irish and Chris King. But I think we got uh, food for thought from the thought for food and from Irish, which will be a great thing for GFAR to move ahead. Thank you. Thank you one and all.